Children's Bioscience Webinar Series. This is a monthly program sponsored by Cohen Veterans Bioscience for the brain research and systems biology communities. Cohen Veterans Bioscience is a nonprofit research alliance whose mission is to transform research in veterans' mental health through translational research. We are focused on understanding the molecular underpinnings of diseases such as PTSD and TBI to develop better treatments and diagnostics. Before I introduce today's speaker, let me walk you through some logistics. This program is being recorded and will be archived in the Cohen Veterans Bioscience YouTube channel and on the website. The presentation will be approximately 45 minutes in length to allow for a Q&A afterwards. Please use the Q&A button to post a question. Today our speaker is Dr. Sebastian Hessler. Dr. Hessler received his doctoral degree from the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Genetics in Germany in 2006, after which he completed postdoctoral training at Harvard University. Dr. Hessler is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Neuroscience at the University of Leuven in Belgium and Principal Investigator and Director of Neuroelectronics Research Flanders, known as NERF, a young academic research initiative founded with the goal to advance our understanding of brain function in health and disease by using and developing novel technologies which integrate neurobiology and nanoscale engineering. Research in Dr. Hessler's lab focuses on how the brain generates prediction error signals in order to drive learning from reward and punishment and also investigates the neural mechanisms underlying novelty detection and behavioral responses to novelty. His lab uses a combination of multi-electrode recording and optogenetic techniques in awake behaving mice. This approach allows for the precise characterization of neuronal firing and for testing the causal contribution of neural firing to specific aspects of behavior. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Hessler. Dr. Hessler? All right. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, today, I want to talk about uh, technologies that uh, can be used in preclinical animal models. And uh, the goal is, on one hand, to illustrate what are these technologies, what can they do, what can they not do, and on the other hand, also try to make a case for why I believe or why we believe these technologies are actually really important in, for finding uh, novel treatments for uh, uh, the diseases such as PTSD. Um, so before I start, um, let me go one, take one step back and say, okay, well, why is brain research so important? And uh, in, in this particular moment in time, if you just look at the numbers for Europe, the cost of brain disease is just enormous. And uh, in, in this slide, you see the numbers for Europe, and you can see that it's about 800 billion per year, which is essentially more than um, diabetes and cardiovascular and cancer combined. And so there's a huge uh, unmet clinical need. Um, and uh, this, this, the, the reason why this clinical need is so unmet is, of course, because you know disorders of the brain are really, really uh, kind of particularly challenging. And so the, the brain itself is really is like the most complex organ in the human body. It's composed of a lot of different uh, cells, cell types, a lot of neurons that form a lot of uh, non-random connections. And uh, so, and amazingly, the whole thing runs on only like 20 watt, which is something I think particularly interesting from a computational point of view. Um, but clearly, in understanding how that thing operates and what happens in disease is a real challenge. Now, uh, luckily, I, I think we are in a time that's particularly exciting, where in several domains, uh, revolutions are going on. So we have, uh, let's say on the hardware side, we have micro and nanofabrication technologies that are available to us today, uh, mainly driven by the, the, the say, computer and the molecular, uh, mobile device industry. 
Um, th these fabrication techniques allow for really building very, very, very small, very sophisticated tools. Um, secondly, there's a, also a revolution going on in biotechnology, and by biotechnology, I really mean the kind of narrow sense, such that uh, you know understanding biology enough so we can use it as a as a technology. And if you think of uh, you know some of the advances, just to name a few, like from optogenetics to genetically encoded calcium indicators, there's really like a whole uh, like a very large range of novel tools available that we can use to study biological systems. Uh, and then third, uh, of course, is the, the algorithm side. So there's a there's a revolution going on in machine learning, deep learning algorithms that actually now gives us uh, a way to actually deal with all large data that we can also now uh, collect. And so I think these these three big trends and three big um, revolutions going on give rise to an enormous amount of opportunity that will ultimately, hopefully, benefit patients. And um, so here in our institute at NERF, uh, and of course in many other places in the world as well, uh, we believe that uh, the, the key is that these technologies, bringing these technologies to the patients, uh, requires neuroscientists, engineers, biologists, and uh, clinicians to work together and develop these novel technologies for measuring the brain so that ultimately we can understand the biology better and ultimately also diagnose and treat uh, patients in the clinic better. Just as a, at a very high level, what are the kind of challenges we face on the technology side? Well, obviously, uh, when it comes to measuring neural activity, or manipulating neural activity in the in the in the brain of a, of an animal uh, or a human, um, the challenges in, in include I mean things like miniaturization. Of course, we want to have very high resolution. We need to have very high specificity. Ideally, everything should be wireless or not or even non-invasive. So I think the challenges are very very clear. Uh, but and there's been progress I think in in a lot of these uh, different aspects and. Um, before going into the details and showing you examples of wh where we believe um, uh, progress has been made or progress can be made, uh, really I want to highlight again that the goal is really to, to build tools that allow us to better understand the disease biology and ultimately we believe we will also come up with like technologies that will eventually cure brain disorders and, and restore brain function. Now, in the context of this uh, seminar, I think what's really critical is to ask the question, well, what's, the, what's really the preclinical value of these neurotechnologies? Um, and by preclinical value, I mean not having a, just building a very sophisticated, elegant uh, tool, but really asking what does it do? What does it help us? How does it help us to find the cure uh, for, for disease? And so this is what I'll try to uh, address now. And uh, let me again take one step back uh, to one of my favorite slides, <laughs> which essentially describes um, um, how, I, how we believe um, uh, we need to tackle the, the, the problem. So if a patient goes see a doctor, it's not because there's some pain or some, typically not because there's some pain or something, it's typically because there's a behavior that's observed that you know the patient himself, herself, or the family uh, observed that you know the behavior is just somewhat not 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 okay. So there's something maladaptive about it. It's a problem, and so the the the, the patients will if, actually be diagnosed mainly based on behavior. Now at the same time, we we know that because the brain and the activity, dynamic activity in the brain, gives rise to the behavior. So somehow something at the level of the neural circuits. Uh, is going wrong. Somehow some computation is not working appropriately uh, and then this this gives rise to the, the to the disease phenotype. Now if you think about cures and drugs and uh, treatments actually most of what we do is typically like small molecules that act more on this like much lower end here. So that that's where the pharmaceutical industry has a lot of uh, experience in like building molecules that block genes, regulatory stuff, or proteins, and ultimately the goal is to find something that acts, a small molecule or something like this, that, that acts on these at the lower level to influence the circuits, which then ultimately should uh, change the behavior to the better. So this, this is the challenge. It's, it's pretty, pretty crazy if you think about uh, you know, the different orders of magnitude uh, 
of, of this kind of hierarchically really complex system. Now, fr from a drug discovery perspective, that means, you know, typically, typically what people do, right, this is a very generic slide, uh, typically what people do, they start with some idea, some molecular lead, and then try to break, come up with like some molecules that are good candidates and test them in some preclinical model, and then ultimately this thing goes into the clinical trial. Now, if you think about the fact that in the end what you want to change in the human is actually the behavior, uh, that is re a real challenge because how do you know which of your compounds is going to change the behavior in a human? It's a really, really long stretch. And uh, while in many diseases, of course, animal models are very useful uh, to predict what's going to happen in a human, I think in the many of the psychiatric disorders this has been very, very difficult. And um, if you just think of, let's say, some of the hallmarks of PTSD, and please keep in mind, I'm not, I'm not a PTSD researcher expert, but um, if you just take some of the, 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 the hallmarks uh, that are observed in, in PTSD patients, uh, such as intrusion, avoidance, or arousal, well, it's not entirely obvious uh, how to look at these things in an animal model. And at the same time, we know that structurally, a lot of the brain looks very similar. We know that the genes and the molecular pathways are all, to a large extent, conserved. Uh, of course, there's also big differences. But uh, what I would like to propose, essentially, is to, to say, OK, well, can we find and identify some dysfunctional neural activity in molecularly defined circuits in patients that are conserved in animals? And so instead of looking at the behavior, which, can, which is, we, I think, sometimes difficult to make the connection. Uh, looking at neural activity as an, in, as an endogenous biomarker, I would say, uh, can be very useful in um, not only in, uh, as a biomarker, but also as a, of course, then for evaluating candidate treatments. And uh, I'm convinced that actually this approach gives a much more robust uh, approach um, than just looking at behavior, because behavior is just, essentially often um, too low dimensional, uh, well the readout of the of behaviors are typically too low dimensional to really allow for a very firm conclusion about what's going on in the brain. So uh, this is the idea essentially, or the claim, the hypothesis, and um, so of course if you want to, if, if, if this is the goal to say okay well let's look at neural activity then we should have ways to look at neural activity in very precise and very sophisticated and good ways. And this is really the, the, the core of the technologies that we've been, we and a lot of other people uh, are working on. And this is really just an overview slide uh, to emphasize that uh, we also believe that, of course, you cannot study a brain in a dish. You can't put the brain in a plastic dish. So you need to study it while it's doing something relevant. And um, so that's why uh, we study the brain uh, in awake behaving animals, typically mice and rodents. And we use all kinds of approaches from optical imaging, which you can see here, to electrical recording, to optogenetics, um, to really get some insights into what's going on in these brains um, while animals are doing something. Now, let me start with uh, just an illustration of the power of calcium imaging, just because it's so amazingly beautiful. Um, so in calcium imaging, you essentially have uh, genetically encoded calcium sensors and as a function of neural activity, the fluorescence will change to give you some very beautiful uh, movies, like such as this one. This is from my colleague uh, here at NERF. It's a it's an, it's, an, it's a movie of um, uh, of visual visual cortex during virtual exploration in a mouse uh, in an awake mouse. And uh, as you can see, every time one of these like, donut shaped things light up, that means the neuron was active. And as you can see, you can look at a lot of neurons in parallel simultaneously. And you even have their like spatial um, organization, so you can look at you know what are uh, what are they doing relative to each other, and uh, this has been pushed all the way to really even relating these activities and these neurons, single neurons, uh, to their like ultra structural properties using EM. Now, um, moving from from the optical recordings uh, to the electrical recordings, uh, electrical recordings. Are, have much better temporal resolution, and um, for, for a long time already, people dream of really having very, very, very high-density electrical recordings, and a lot of progress has already been made. 
Now, just to summarize again, like what, why, why we believe high-density electrical recordings will be useful. Well, the the dream is, of course, to to just completely sample a local population of neurons, or at least a large chunk of it. And uh, by having more neurons recorded simultaneously, the idea is, of course, also that you know a single experiment from from a single animal will be much more meaningful. Uh, it will be much uh, easier to get. We'll just get a lot more information out of each animal, and it will be much better for analysis because the statistical power is going to increase tremendously. And in this illustration, you just see a bunch of uh, a chunk of cortex in the hippocampus, and uh, you know one of those. Uh, idealistic devices that would just record uh, along a whole uh, long axis um, the neural activity. Now, this has been an active area of research. Uh, many people have uh, worked on this, including here at, at IMEC, which is one, a, a semiconductor uh, research infrastructure that our institute is located uh, on, or uh, on their campus. And so, it, in IMEC, one of the approaches that people have taken is essentially to say, okay, we're not going to only put a, a passive device into the brain, but we're going to make an active silicon probe where um, on this kind of needle itself, signals can get uh, amplified, routed, gated. And so by using these approaches, you can just increase the number of channels by a lot, uh, up to you know, the, the latest is 1,400. And um, so the idea is that with this approach, you can really sample the neural tissue at a density that will really give you uh, a lot of individual neurons. Now, the one project I want to really um, spend a bit more time on is uh, is, a, is an ongoing project that's uh, funded by uh, and led by HHMI in a consortium with Holcom Trust, Gatsby, and Ellen. Uh, it's a, it's the, the idea is to develop a high-density neural probe uh, for use uh, in mice and rats. And it's actually built uh, here uh, in the clean room uh, right under my office. And um, this, this really very nice device has uh, a lot of channels, active uh, channels. It has 120 uh, channels. The version where I'm going to show you the data has 120 channels. Uh, it gives really high quality uh, spike recordings. You can see that you know, the same neuron can, because the, the, the contacts are so close to each other, you can see the same neuron in multiple uh, uh, multiple channels. Um, we'll then use um, principal component analysis and other other tricks to um, to sort out you know which which of these is actually a single unit. And um, we've also developed a, a GPU powered platform to really get the data out in in, in 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 reasonable amount of time. Simply because when you have a lot of channels and record a lot of signals at the same time, you just generate this huge amount of data. And so that really actually calls for uh, development in its own right to, 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 to write um, you know, the, the routine to actually deal with this data. Now, this is all done. And what you can really get then is like this really beautiful um, high density readout of neural activity across uh, brain regions. And so this is just an example. Uh, each the, the the neurons that have the same the same neuron uh, when it's active uh, is colored. So this one is active here and then it's active again. And so each each one has a different color. Uh, and you can see that there's more than hundred uh, in this in this overview. This is the same same example. It's just now ordered based on essentially the, the the position of where these neurons are. And you can see that you know in 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 uh, you can you can get more than hundred neuron uh, units. Uh, in a single experiment, so that's really high density, uh, and the, the probe. Needless to mention, that the whole probe is of course very small and very thin, so it's not causing much damage. So it's a really, really nice device. Um, now, I've stressed that you know having high density is really critical, but actually, you might as well say, well, wait a minute. I mean, in the in the brain, there's all these neurons. They all have different properties. They come in different uh, flavors. Uh, right, there's exciter inhibitory neurons, and there's a lot of subtypes, molecular defined subtypes, and so on. So, um, wouldn't it be more important to actually know which neurons are actually doing what, uh, and essentially have information about the, the the identity of the cell type? And just to illustrate the diversity of cell types, I put this uh, drawing up here, which is just you know ex just simple examples to illustrate how different neurons can actually look and how they can just their morphology is very different, and not surprisingly, also then their function is going to be different. So, 
Um, to address this challenge, uh, we've also been working on optogenetic tagging, which is a very simple idea. Essentially, uh, you put chanodopsin in one cell type, uh, express it uh, selectively using genetic tricks, and um, uh, if you then put your electrode and shine a blue light, the neuron will respond in a, a time-locked fashion to the blue light activation, whereas the neurons that do not express chanodopsin will not do that. And so that way, and it's just a really a, a very simple illustration, you would be able to tell you know, a signal coming from the green or the red, uh, red neuron uh, if you do your rec this before you start recording. Now, this approach is, is very nice, um, but of course, typically in the brain it's dark, so uh, how do you get the light into the brain and also record uh, at, high, at high enough density at the same time? And so this is, the, is this another device I'd like to discuss. Which is um, uh, an in it's also a silicon-based device that integrates uh, waveguide technology, so that you use the light comes out uh, at defined spots and a defined angle on the, this this end here. At the same time, you can see that the in the red circles here, these are tetrode configuration recording sites, so that allows you to record and illuminate uh, at the same time. And uh, just just an illustration that actually indeed light goes out. Um, and uh, we've also used it in vivo and validated it. It's a very beautiful device. And uh, you can see here, uh, in, this, in this, uh, these four, four channels, um, uh, when the blue light is turned on, this neuron responds vigorously. And when you turn it off, it stops. And uh, importantly, uh, we don't have any light artifacts or something like this. And also, the, uh, the waveform, so the, the, the spike shape, is not changed when the light uh, is activating uh, the neuron. So it's another very nice uh, device. The, the number of channels obviously is much less, uh, but therefore um, the, the specificity of the recording uh, will be improved. Um, and I think a very important uh, step as well. And of course, we're not the only ones to build uh, tools. And I, I really want to highlight um, also people, um, uh, other people work. Uh, really to, to, to also illustrate how far these um, uh, things can go, how far you can build these things. Uh, this is an example uh, that integrates uh, several modalities, so not only optical and uh, electrical, but also has, um, has a, uh, the ability uh, to inject a liquid or to provide microfluidic access to the brain. Um, this device is not entirely mass production compatible at this moment, but it's a very interesting approach. And this is another one that I find very interesting. It's um, from Polina Anikeva's lab in MIT. It's essentially an approach where an optic fiber is uh, is pulled by a thermal drawing, and essentially it's it's essentially a single little fiber that has uh, optical um, illumination. It has recording ability. And it has also a fluidic uh, channel, so this is a very interesting, um, interesting device. And um, before, before essentially, um, I'll, uh, I move on uh, with with evaluating some of these probes. I want to also bring up one additional method that I'm not sure um, everyone's uh, is is fully aware of it, which I think is a, but it's a very interesting technique which is uh, functional ultrasound imaging. Um, this is something that um, has been developed a few years ago uh, for, or has been improved for use in the brain a few years ago. And essentially, um, with this ultrasound, functional ultrasound imaging, uh, it's possible to get, let's say, Information that's maybe relevant to fMRI or similar to fMRI because it's essentially imaging uh, imaging blood flow. Um, it has decent temporal resolution um, and has decent spatial resolution, uh, and importantly, it's non-invasive. And um, so this is from my colleague Alain Aubin, uh, where uh, it's just illustrating the the, the, the setup or the, the how how it works. Essentially, the ultrasound transducer is placed on the head of the rat and it's for freely moving. Uh, and then, essentially, uh, the brain can be imaged and you know, parts, regions of interest can be selected. And you can see, for example, in this case here, uh, somewhere in barrel cortex, there's a region of interest selected where uh, every time the animal 
um, whisk something, uh, detect something with the whisker is going to be a signal, and it's just showing this uh, in, a, in a task as well. Oops, sorry. Uh, so this is in a task. The animal moves towards the reward part. Um, there's a movie that's working also. And you can see the signal uh, here. And essentially, at the moment the animal touches uh, and whisks uh, a signal for, uh, close to the reward part, uh, the signal will go up. So you can use this to really uh, look at neural activity, uh, or at a proxy of neural activity, I would say. Um, the, the nice thing is, of course, in particular, I mean, this is mainly for, for, for other type preclinical research, certainly in, in there for stroke and other things like that. Uh, you can also look at the blood vessels with very nice precision. Um, and uh, But also use it for really like kind of brain imaging in uh, small animals. Now, one important thing is that, you know, I've shown you a lot of cool gadgets. And um, there's a very big difference between building a prototype and showing that it works and actually providing a tool to the community so that it can be widely used. And uh, of course, our ambition is really to make sure that these tools are used widely. And so for that, it's important to assess really the technology readiness of these, these approaches to make sure uh, that we you know, go all the way to make it uh, ready for use. And uh, one question that comes up a lot is, of course, the question of inflammatory reactions. So if you have invasive tools that measure neural activity inside the brain, silicon probes or other probes, is there an inflammatory reaction? And the, despite the fact that, of course, they are invasive, actually, we've looked at this a little bit. And it, it, it seems like uh, after some time, the, after, let's say, the initial uh, implantation, it's pretty, uh, pretty neglectable. And uh, from what we can tell, it doesn't change neural activity um, majorly. Uh, so that's OK. Now, um, the validation uh, is clear. So th that is something we always do for all the tools we work with. And that's what's always needed. So all these things have been all, both the optogenetic probe, but of course, also the the high density probe, all of these are currently validated, and not only by us, but by multiple labs. Um, and um, the large data, of course, I mentioned already, the, if you have really high density, high channel counts, you will get a lot of data. Uh, but this can be handled uh, pretty well. Now, a key question is, well, when is this really ready? When can this be used by a lot of people? And that's where uh, it becomes a bit more difficult, because I think additional efforts are needed to make sure that you know, we have enough hardware and you know, all the protocols are in place. So it's not immediately usable. Um, uh, Long-term monitoring at this moment also uh, provides a little bit of difficulty that uh, unless devices are really, really, really small so that they can chron be chronically implanted, um, Long-term measurements are more difficult. So with the two-photon, of course, that's not a problem. And also for the um, uh, ultrasound, that's not a problem. But for, for the neural probes, uh, unless they're really, really small and can be chronically implanted, um, it's a bit uh, difficult. And right now, part of these devices, the back end of the device that's not inside the brain, is still a bit large. And there's no wireless options available at this moment. And so. The, the last part is, what about the fluidics? Well, so as I've demonstrated, or as I've shown, um, there are solutions already that have been built for fluidic. I don't know about other, other people's um, uh, development. But fr from our perspective, um, we have not yet built uh, a device with an integrated fluidic interface. So that will still uh, take some time to build. Now, as a conclusion, um, uh, I've presented examples of technical progress and methods for high density electrical and optical uh, recording of neural activity. And uh, I hope I convince you that the, this really works these days to get a lot of data out of a brain. Um, and I make a, the point that I believe that these tools will enable discovery and insights into the disease mechanisms. Uh, by simply giving researchers the ability to look with much more detail what the neural circuits are doing uh, in awake behaving animals. Uh, but I also think that it will be useful um, to use these technologies um, 
to validate uh, as, a, as a validation of disease biomarkers in animals such that we can look at neural activities that are dysfunctional or different or weird or whatever you prefer to call it so that, that uh, in, in patients and we can find uh, something equivalent in an animal I think this will be a very good biomarker and with high density recording or measurement tools we can of course look at these much better and then finally, I believe, like once we establish such a, a bio, some biomarkers in, in animals, we can of course then also evaluate the effect kind of the treatments have on these biomarkers. And you can envision something like you know when there's, uh, for example, limited uh, activity in prefrontal cortex in a, to inhibit fear, then uh, you know, is, is there a way to in, to boost that activity? in a specific uh, context. So the, the, these are kind of experiments you can envision. So I think it will overall facilitate also the discovery of uh, novel drugs. And then uh, last uh, point, and I think that's a very important point, is that um, at this moment we need to make sure that these techniques will also be adopted by the research community. And uh, that indeed, as I mentioned, requires further efforts such as you know, on hardware, but also on distribution. We, I think we also need to uh, create protocols and standardize uh, the use uh, of these devices to really to validate uh, the, the techniques uh, as a community. And that's something that uh, we're also very heavily working on in all these days um, to get these things out uh, to the community. All right. Uh, well, with this, um, I will end. Um, and thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward uh, to the questions. Thank you, Dr. Hessler. We'll give it a second to see if any questions come in uh, because of the delays on the computer. We'll wait and see. So far, I don't have any questions. Are there any questions? Just going to wait a bit longer. Well, it appears I'm not receiving any questions. I guess that's because you did such a spectacular job. <laughs> and all we can do is hope for this to uh, reach fruition in animals and then in humans to be useful. Yes. Thank and you very anyone... much. All right, if anyone has a question, can also send me an email at any point later in time. Yeah, give them your email address. Uh, well, you have, to, you have to check it on www.nerf.be. Okay, thanks. And anybody who has a question following can then send Dr. Hessler an email and ask your questions. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.